Great, I'm excited to uh, walk you all through log cache, uh, and I've got a bunch of content, so I'm gonna get, get started. Why is my slides not? There we go. Um, so just a quick overview of our agenda. Uh, I'll start with really the reasons and the motivations as to why we built LogCache. Uh, LogCache was built to solve some specific problems. We'll take a look at what those problems are. Uh, we are gonna do some live demos, so wish me luck. Uh, hopefully the Wi-Fi cooperates. And uh, I want to do a bit of feature comparison on the user experience that LogCache can provide versus the user experience that Loggergator provides. And uh, the reason for those feature comparisons is for us to look forward a little bit and talk about some architectures, we plans we have uh, for Loggergator. So, the place to, to start is uh, really a, an issue that exists now, uh, and this issue is especially apparent if you have a large foundation. Um, so when you execute really any of three of these commands, either you CF push your application, you request recent logs from your application, or you wanna see the container metrics for your application by running CF app, that sends a request to the traffic controller, and the traffic controller really does the naive thing here, and it goes to all of the Doppler uh, components and retrieves the log or the metric that you're interested in, brings that back into the traffic controller, and then has to order or select the most recent metric depending on your request. So you can kind of see how that doesn't necessarily scale. Uh, it does also have to wait on the network connection over to the Doppler. And if you're in a large foundation, if you've ever seen your uh, app return zero for container metrics, that's the uh, Loggergator system triggering a circuit breaker. Uh, so the metrics in that case aren't actually zero, it's that we couldn't make sense of the requests that we got from the Dopplers, and to avoid a timeout and an error, especially in CF push, we're returning zero in that circumstance. So we added that patch maybe about a year ago because we saw those CF push failures starting to creep up on large foundations. But when we added that patch, we kind of knew, hey, this is something that we need to go back and address properly. So there's kind of the key evidence we had is out there we had this problem, uh, like I mentioned, zero being returned on CF app is kind of the, the symptom of that problem. Um, it's also the case that if you have a large foundation when you run CF logs recent, the chances of there being missing logs increases with the size of your foundation. There's a good chance that we didn't get to go through all the logs and return to you all of the recent ones, so it increases the chances that that data set is incomplete. We also found as we started thinking about how are we going to build a new interface to retrieve container metrics that developers would have an easier time interfacing with the Loggerator system if they had a RESTful interface. The Loggerator system is really based on a push mechanism and if you've ever developed a nozzle for the Loggerator system, you'll know that managing a push API can be challenging. Uh, one of the things I've, I've said about Loggergator, Loggergator is great, all you have to do is be able to consume an infinite amount of data forever. Uh, so that's kind of the case with any push API, uh, but we had this theory that if you could provide a RESTful interface, it'd be a lot easier for app developers to go in there, develop an application or an automation that read from the cache and performed an action. Uh, we also had this hypothesis that we could improve the command line experience. Uh, the command line experience for logs and metrics is pretty limited on Cloud Foundry. Like I mentioned, the, really, the only ways that you can interact with the logs and metrics on, on your application is by running CF logs, or that a lot of people don't even actually realize that this goes for uh, Loggergator, but that CF app command will also pull from Loggergator to get those container metrics. So when we uh, embarked on developing Loggergator, uh, there's kind of an anecdote here that I, I wanted to call out. So we had this hypothesis around the uh, CLI, and uh, one of the things that we found to be a really effective tool as a team was to think about our project as a full stack project and to develop not only the CLI, but to develop a standalone Bosch release that we could put into our production environment. 
Uh, so our production environment, which is Pivotal Web Services, is running CF deployment, and uh, you know, log cache at the time was not part of CF deployment. We had went ahead and uh, deployed a new release called log cache. We configured it with the appropriate certificates, uh, and we went the full CI route like uh, Pivotal likes to do. And when I would push accept on a story in our backlog, uh, the pipelines would pick up the latest commit from our repo and deploy that out to production on Logcache. We were the only users of that system, so we could kind of take a few more chances than we might with an actual live production environment. Uh, but it was uh, a really refreshing experience for us because we got to control that full stack of developing the server-side components and then developing uh, the CLI along with it. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and pull up my live demo. So um, uh, the demo I'm going to give is for the log cache CLI. You can do a Google the log cache CLI, go find the, the install commands. I've already got it installed. Um, and you'll see that I'm already round, logged into a, a foundation with a, a couple of apps here. So uh, the log uh, cache CLI gives me access to a couple of new commands. The uh, main command I'm going to start with is the CF tail command. Uh, so the TF tail command is designed around the, the Unix tail command, has a similar set of flags. Uh, and uh, we'll uh, take a look at this app called Log Spinner. So um, right away, when I go ahead and uh, run CF tail on Log Spinner, you'll, you'll kind of notice that this looks a little bit different than CF logs. Uh, first, the default state is different. I got sort of a logs recent type request without providing a flag. We went for, we think that the default situation most developers are interested in is tell me what just happened recently, not necessarily open a stream, which is what CF logs does. So kind of, again, thinking fresh about the user experience, again, it gave us that, that perspective of what would we do if we're, we're designing this from the ground up. You'll also see that instead of getting logs, I got a bunch of metrics for my uh, request. Uh, and that's because uh, this app's been sitting idle for a little bit, and there's no logs that have been produced. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and curl the application. Uh, log Spinner is an, an application we use in all of our testing, really. And uh, it allows you to curl the app and produce some logs. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and just uh, run that tail command again, and actually I'm going to add a type flag now and just go and look at those logs. Um, so uh, you'll see now that you know, I've limited the result just to the, to the log output. Um, it will capture the application logs and any of the associated CAPI logs or router logs with that application. Um, you can you know, do things like get a number of logs. Uh, it is a cache, so uh, there's only a limited amount of data in the cache. You know, I specified 100. I only got uh, about a dozen logs here. Um, but that's because that's all that's available in the cache at this time. Um, uh, so just kind of going through a couple more of the flags. Uh, I mentioned you know, streaming logs. Those are always good. So let's go ahead and open uh, a stream now to the uh, log cache. Uh, and let me curl that again so we can watch kind of in action what the, uh, what the following experience looks like. And it looks like CF logs. Uh, uh, it, it's kind of a little known fact, but CF logs in the CLI actually batches and delays the logs about 300 milliseconds. Um, and it does that because uh, out of order logs are kind of hard to deal with and they don't provide much value. Uh, Diego puts a timestamp on the log that has nanosecond precision. So it is something we are able to achieve to sort those logs in a perfect order. Uh, but the problem with that is you do have to wait to make sure. We don't necessarily, in our system, know that we're going to retrieve the logs in order. Um, so the CLI uh, in the CF logs, if you have the right version, will wait and, and sort that. If you happen to be seeing out of order logs with your CLI, definitely upgrade your CLI. It is something that uh, we found got undone in the CLI at one point. So we went ahead and added that fix back in. Uh, log cache solves that problem by server side keeping all of those logs in order. So every request to log cache has a guaranteed order with it. Um, so kind of just one of the improvements that uh, the interface provides. Uh, 
So that is kind of the one for one on how the CF tail command can replace the CF logs command. Uh, but let's take a little bit, a closer look at what those metrics looked like. So I'm gonna stop this and I'm gonna tail log spinner again. And this time I'm gonna specify a type of metrics and I'm also gonna format uh, the output into uh, JSON and pipe it into JQ. Uh, so now, of course, you'll, you'll see uh, the results coming out in, uh, in a JSON format. And uh, actually what you're looking at here is the underlying envelope structure that Loggergator uses. Uh, so, uh, you know, this is really kind of the self-documenting approach for our RESTful interface for log cache. Um, so what you see here at the command line is the same interface that you can get using a web app. And log cache will accept OAuth tokens, so you don't have to worry about mutual TLS. Uh, you can interface with this really the same, using the same RESTful interfaces that most web application developers are, are familiar with. So, like I said, that was kind of our hypothesis that we could develop these RESTful interfaces and that an ecosystem of uh, tools could develop around that. Um, uh, one, I'm gonna switch gears now from the app developer experience and uh, look at the experience of what an operator can do with log cache. Um, so I happen to be logged into this foundation uh, with the CF admin user and an additional uh, command that the uh, log cache CLI gives me is this command called log meta. Log meta will take a look at my OAuth token and give me an appropriate view across the entire cache. So since I'm logged in as an admin user that has the Doppler firehose scope, I have access to look at the firehose. Um, so you'll see when I run the log meta command, I get a list of what effectively is all the, all the components that make up CF deployment. Uh, so uh, if you've ever like bumbled around trying to use like CF nozzle, by the way, if you use CF nozzle, don't use CF nozzle. Uh, CF nozzle can damage your logger system and cause drop messages. Uh, this system, since it's reading from a cache, is uh, harmless to your logger gator uh, throughput. And uh, you can take a look at you know, what's in the cache, how much duration you have for those components. Um, and then again, you can use that same tail command to take a look at a component's metrics. Uh, so this is kind of a first for the platform. We're bringing some command line observability to operators to be able to quickly take a look at metrics. You don't have to go bounce over to your Datadog or your new relic. You can actually look at the metrics right here. Um, and one of the other powerful things is this is the same uh, format as is available to the app developer. So if you are developing automations or you've developed an alerting protocol within your organization, you could apply that to both your foundation components as well as the applications and even service instances that exist on, on, uh, on your foundation. So, all right, that went well. That was it for the live demo. So I'm gonna jump back into slides. So just kind of going through uh, those uh, user experiences once more. Um, recent logs, we took a look at that. That's kind of a, now our first class experience without any flags. Uh, the old logger system was actually age limited. It's kind of a weird contract, but once logs got to be, I think it was an hour long, we just started getting rid of them. Um, the new log cache system is actually based on the log volume. So if you exceed the buffer of around 10,000 logs, I think is the, the cache size, uh, we'll start dropping those older logs. Um, but it means that we're kind of providing a fair uh, a sharing across whether your app is really noisy or whether your app is just slow at emitting logs. We, we kind of treat all apps the same. Um, Follow logs, we, we took a look at that. I didn't do the shootout, so you, we could look at exactly how it compares, but uh, I, I've done that a couple times, and it's really hard to tell the difference between log cache and, and CF logs. Um, 
We took a look at container metrics. We've expanded the capability there quite a bit. And uh, actually, a couple more points on that. If you are uh, using the metrics forwarder or a Spring app, you can also get those metrics into LogCache. Uh, if you bind the metrics forwarder to your Spring app, all the, the custom app metrics that you're producing through the Spring actuators will also appear in LogCache. Um, we, uh, we took a look at the uh, component metrics. That was the log meta view where we were uh, taking a look at the uh, Doppler and, and kind of that new command line experience. I don't really see that as a replacement for the firehose, but it is uh, solving some of the same problems. So uh, there's a little bit of parity there with uh, how component metrics are sent through the firehose. And then we didn't take a look at service instance metrics. I didn't have a demo set up for that. But uh, service instances uh, that are using a, a couple of uh, particular pieces of tooling called the uh, service metrics forwarder, uh, those will also get their metrics uh, sent in such a way that the app developer has access to them. Um, and that's a, a new feature um, as of the recent CF deployment versions that include log cache. So as I mentioned, we had this hypothesis that developing uh, a RESTful interface was going to empower app developers to build more automation, that using a RESTful interface was easier to deal with for things like auto-scaling or alerting or charting. And to an extent, that, that turned out to be true. Uh, the Pivotal auto-scaler that we ship uses log cache. Um, it was the first product to go out the door and, and use log cache in a production capacity. Um, and it's worked great. Uh, it was really easy for the team to develop. Uh, but what we found as we kind of rolled out the first iterations of the RESTful interface is that uh, the app development teams, they wanted a more robust way to query this time series data. And uh, when we started scratching around and looking at what was out there, we find that time series storing, storage and querying is something that is well-established in our cousin community, the Kubernetes community. Uh, so an experimental feature of log cache uh, is the ability to query log cache with PromQL. So if you're not familiar with PromQL, PromQL is a uh, Prometheus query language. It's a query language that is especially designed for time series data. Uh, it's pretty common when you are querying time series data that you want to do a common set of calculus or arithmetic on the results of your query. Um, so a, a really common pattern is that you don't want to look at a counter going up in a slope on a hill. You want to look at the rate of change of that counter. So you want to look at how, what is the rate of drops that are occurring in the uh, logregator system, for example, not what is the total number of drops. Um, and PromQL provides you a query language that will execute those functions. Uh, that hypothesis is, is just being born into some of our newest products at Pivotal. Uh, this is a screenshot of the PCF metrics team and, and the work they're working on with log cache. And um, this is a, a real dashboard of you know, basic container metrics being pulled out of Prom, uh, being pulled out of log cache via PromQL and, and charted uh, using some, some charting libraries that exist. It also enables some pretty cool applications. I want to put this one out there. It's kind of uh, an uh, accolade to uh, one of my team members who, who put this together. Uh, I won't tell you where to find it, but if you're good at Google, you can find it. Um, and it's, uh, I also tell you, it, it's not necessarily like approved in production, uh, but it's a, a pretty cool routing technique that uses PromQL as a definition language for determining a canary strategy. And so by that I mean uh, you're able to define a plan in the terms of a PromQL statement. And that PromQL statement might say something like, as the rate of uh, 200 requests uh, increases, start routing traffic to the new application. 
Um, so this allows you to only route traffic if your new version of the application is successfully returning responses. Um, that's kind of the tip of the iceberg. You can do all kinds of plans. You can do 50-50 traffic. You can uh, put in a custom metric into your application and, and route based on that. Uh, it, but it's just one of the applications that is popular using PromQL, and we're starting to see as a benefit we can bring uh, to the Cloud Foundry community. Uh, Chip mentioned building bridges, and PromQL is really a powerful bridge to standardization of time series data on Cloud Foundry. So I, I'll, I'll admit, uh, as we got all this ready, we started this experiment with PromQL, I found myself saying, wait a second, did we just build a time series database? And the answer is yes, we did build a time series database. Uh, uh, but the important question, of course, I'm, I'm familiar with the axiom of don't write your own database. Uh, so uh, we, I, I, there was a part of me that felt Wait, what do we just do when, when uh, in my, I felt like a little bit hoodwinked by my engineers. Uh, but um, the important question to us was, did we solve the problem? Um, so, you know, kind of going back to the reasons why log aggregator was, or excuse me, log cache was built was really around those original problems of container metrics and logs recent. And there's still a little bit of integration that's being untwined between the cloud controller and the CF CLI, make sure that all the hooks that it currently exists to talk to Logregator, talk to log cache. But in terms of those two problems, we can confidently say that we have solved those specific problems. Um, I also think testing out our hypotheses of is a RESTful interface a powerful building block, uh, I, I also feel like we were able to achieve positive results there as well. Um, it kind of took some twists and turns that we didn't expect. I definitely didn't. I didn't go into this thinking either we were building a database or that we were building a database that was going to speak the query language of Prometheus. Um, but as we evolved it, we've realized that speaking the query language of Prometheus has huge advantages to services that want to be portable across both Cloud Foundry and Kubernetes. So it was a little bit of an unintentional circumstance, but um, more and more, we're starting to look like we have a component that acts like the Prometheus server. So that's all well and good, but if you take a step back from the problem of loggergator and large foundations, we're still hearing a lot of concerns from the community. Uh, I think actually almost everyone who booked time at my, on my schedule this conference, uh, they were coming to me with concerns because they've reached 40 or maybe 50 Dopplers and they're starting to see that it's really hard to keep Loggergator within the recommended SLO of 99% reliability. Uh, and there's a reason for that. Uh, one of the uh, things that is uh, a problem with the shared architecture of Loggergator is that the number of connections that the Dopplers need to manage, um, it has the following formula. So the connections equals the number of log API VMs, so this is your traffic controllers, your number of Doppler VMs times the number of syslog drains you have plus the number of nozzles you have plus the number of log streams that happen to be open at the time. There's actually kind of like a plus one in there because the log cache is kind of like a nozzle. <laughs> um, so if you kind of do the math, if you have like 40 or 50 Dopplers and you have 10 traffic controllers, that's 500 times another number that's probably could be as many as how many applications you have on your platform times another number which could be how many app developers are using your platform right now. So the number of connections can get into the tens to hundreds of thousands and Doppler garbage collection can't keep up. Um, so if you are getting to uh, that 40, 50 Doppler range, there are some scaling techniques that we have seen help. Um, kind of the uh, mantra before has always been add more Dopplers. Uh, it, it, as you get to those higher numbers, there's, there's different knobs that you can, you can start twisting to uh, not stress out this equation too much. But the uh, shared architecture is, is really at the heart of, of what's causing this problem. So we wanted to think about why do we have a shared architecture? Uh, uh, 
when we thought about our feature set, we didn't find anything in the feature set that actually required a shared architecture. You know, despite the name of Loggergator, there's not actually much aggregation service that the Loggergator transport mechanism provides. Uh, the aggregation is actually left to the downstream consumer. Um, uh, one of the uh, places that we saw as a starting point for uh, shared nothing architecture is the syslog drains. You go back to that equation, and I mentioned syslog drains, that could be as many as applications on your platform. You could even set up two or three on a particular application. Um, so that is a way we can dramatically change the numbers in that equation. Uh, so something we just incepted, I, I, I sent the feature proposal out to the CF Dev mailing list maybe two weeks ago, uh, is uh, something we're calling agent-based syslog draining. Uh, so, the concept here is, is similar to systems like Fluent, um, where the agent itself will talk directly to the end destination. There's some tricky engineering here with managing state between CAPI and the Diego cells where the agent's gonna live, um, but we think we have a handle on how to manage that state in such a way that we won't take out cloud controller. Uh, just taking away the syslog drains is going to take a ton of stress off the loggerator system. Um, so we think that's gonna have huge gains on its own. Uh, but it's, it's not enough for us to completely move away from this shared architecture. Um, and that's kind of why I was highlighting that feature parity we have with log cache CLI versus CF logs, because once we add the, CS, uh, the, the syslogs uh, to an agent-based approach, the next step will be for us to send things to log cache using an agent-based approach as well. Um, when you start to look at the features now in terms of a shared nothing architecture, uh, this is kind of the full feature set of what Loggergator does. So um, syslog drains, we're gonna start there. We're gonna move those to an agent-based uh, draining approach and uh, we're under development on that now. So uh, in the next three or four weeks, I'm hoping we'll start to do some private tests. I know there's, there's, a, there's some eager volunteers who would also like to uh, execute those tests. So um, that's something we're in flight on now. We're, we're uh, hoping to land in the next major CF deployment release. Um, and I didn't really mention this, but we also plan to include a configuration that doesn't require an app developer to specify the destination, but requires, it allows the operator to specify a single destination for all the logs. Um, and that's popularly uh, consumed in the open source via the Firehost to syslog nozzle. Uh, we can provide that same log uh, transport using the agent-based approach. Um, we talked about recent logs and how the log cache uh, component can provide the equivalent behavior there. Uh, same with follow log, same with container metrics. Um, and once we have uh, done really those first five, uh, I think we'll have sort of effectively reduced that equation to hundreds of connections. Um, so the, the last piece in that equation is what are we gonna do with the metric delivery uh, we think that an agent-based approach does make sense for metric delivery from components as well. Uh, that said, we also think it's a long ways away from us reaching the scaling limits of just transporting metrics from our components through the fire hose. And there's a lot of nozzles out there that we will break if we completely change the, age, the, the metric architecture. Um, so that one's like a little bit further down the road. There may be a plug, like I mentioned Fluent, there may be a plug-in architecture we could go for there. Um, but uh, we think these next five items on our roadmap are going to really help with the, the large foundation challenges. It's also an end of an era in terms of my time on Loggergator. Uh, uh, some of you may already know Johannes. Uh, Pivotal has no nominated Johannes to take over as PM for Loggergator. Uh, Johannes has been working on Cloud Foundry since 2013, actually. So uh, he's uh, not new to the community and uh, has been living in Germany for the last couple of years. So many of you may already know him. Uh, but he's been doing an outstanding job. I couldn't be handing over to uh, someone to put it in better hands. So. Um, Really, last but not least, I just want to say thanks to the community and uh, for the opportunity. I uh, really have enjoyed working on Loggergator and have learned a ton. So that's it.
Any questions? <clears throat> Any questions to Adam? One. Yeah. Um, there is a, a notion of counter, counter. A In counter, yes. Counter, yeah. Yep. Sorry for my Basel accent. Uh, do you need any, I mean, change to your code to get this counter, like uh, uh, micrometer.io? There, uh, there is some uh, compatibility uh, challenges with the counter and micrometer. Um, we recently released a change to the loggergator agent. Uh, I, I want to make sure I get this right. It, I think we'll... Uh, rec receive only a total now and ignore a delta. Um, so I think that is the, the specific change. You'll need the latest Loggergator agent release to consume that change. Um, but that just came out recently, like within the last month or so. Okay. So I believe that addresses the problem. That was, that was the intent of the change. Okay. I think we have time for one more. Yep. Hi, thanks for the talk. Uh, so, uh, since you're, you have built a new database uh, <laughs> which supports PromQL, did you consider using TSDB, which is for Prometheus, working fine with PromQL? It, we're definitely uh, starting that experimentation now. Uh, we, uh, like I said, we, we kind of came to the realization, wow, we just built a database. And not only did we build a database, we made it interop with a query language that is already popular in the observability community. Um, so we're definitely looking at bringing Prometheus onto the platform. There are subtleties to things like counters that actually do have some impact in how do we think about doing that. Um, but uh, we, we definitely see a future where you potentially could bring multiple different storage for your metrics, um, whether that's Prometheus, InfluxDB, or a proprietary data service as well. OK, I think time's up, unfortunately. But I oh, think Adam will be I'll be around. hanging out. So yeah, hit me up with questions. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks.